you bow with me? Father in heaven, we come to you at this time asking that you be with us as we come together. We want to ask that you would be with those that are ill, uh, John Gorth and uh, others that were mentioned that were ill, and that you would, if it be your will, that you, they would enjoy a speedy recovery and full and back with us. We want to thank you for the people that, that come together here to make this place everything that it is for a meeting place, the, the, the people that teach the classes that our children might be able to be taught at young ages, that uh, the people that clean the building and prepare the, the, the memorial, the Lord's Supper Memorial on Sunday and all the jobs. There's, there's so many things that it takes to make a congregation really run well and we thank you that we have those people here that do that and that we have a comfortable place to be able to come together and to worship you and to study from your word. We want to ask you if you will watch over us in our lives and guide us with your word. And we thank you always for your son Jesus and for his life and for his death and resurrection that we might through faith in him through obedience to your word be able to have that hope of being resurrected and spending eternity with you in heaven be with us always and forgive us of our sins as we repent of them and, and as we forgive others of their sins in Christ's name amen Well, good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to be, hopefully, we'll see how it goes, but I'm shooting to do the final kings of Israel, but you can see on my list there's a lot of them, but there's not a lot said about them, so maybe we'll be able to get through them, maybe not. But that's our goal for tonight, and then we'll also talk about Amaziah and, Amaziah and Uzziah of Judah, and which are interesting topics. So Amaziah we've talked about already. Uh, it, get, I guess first review. Jeroboam II, uh, this is not going to be a surprise to us. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He's a king of Israel. Of course he did evil in the sight of the Lord, because they all did, I believe. And uh, he did not depart from the sin of Jeroboam. Uh, so that's one of the things, you know, this, you know, another guy in the lineage of uh, harmful kings. One of the things I was thinking about, because there's one guy they don't really talk about. He was only king for a month. So they give him a little bit of a pass. But the rest of them, up until uh, Pekiah, which is second to last king of Israel, um, they all do the sin of Jeroboam. But it makes you think, when, they're bringing, when that's brought up specifically in Scripture, it makes you think, you know, even this far down the road, they could have changed. And in fact, interestingly enough, uh, Hosea, which is the last king of Israel, he did evil on the side of the Lord, but not like the other kings. Apparently, he finally got away from the tradition of Jeroboam, uh, and, but any of these kings could have. And the Lord really wanted them to, and I think it's commented on because they failed to do what the Lord called them to do. Uh, Jeroboam the se uh, second is no different, but one of the things that kind of stands out about his reign is this is where he is actually in the middle of a lot of famous prophets. So Jonah was a prophet who uh, prophesied to him. Amos prophesied to him in his day. In fact, there's a story in Amos about how Jeroboam II didn't condemn him when everyone else did. Uh, Hosea, it mentions uh, Jeroboam II and prophesied in his time. And one of the interesting things you can see in this is uh, you can see what Jeroboam's 
kingdom was like uh, from just the description in Kings and Chronicles. But then you can go into Amos and you get a little bit more insight on what Amos is talking about, but also you get an insight into kind of the inner workings of Israel, their political system, what was life like in there at that time. And you see there's this disparity between classes. You have the rich and the, and the poor, and the rich are just taking advantage of the poor. There's a lot of injustice, a lot of innocent bloodshed, a lot of um, corruption. And you see all these things going on. And so it isn't just that the king is evil in the sight of the Lord. It's that the king is leading the people into the evil with him. And you can see all that happening at the same time. Uh, last week, we talked about Athaliah for a moment. Uh, she was ruling queen of Judah. Uh, she attempted to eradicate the lineage of David from the throne. And she was very close to doing it. And, but the Lord spared Joash uh, through the work of, a, of his, um, I guess, aunt. And then also Jehoiada, uh, the high priest, um, brought him out of there. Now, he wasn't a spring chicken. I think he would have been in his late 90s when he took Joash in. And then uh, he died at 130, I think three years before the end of, uh, of uh, Joash's 27-year reign. So he was in his hundreds when he brought Joash to the throne and did that stuff. So anyway, it's just you kind of see that... Um, Je Jehoiada was a good man. He really influenced the king. But something that I think is important is his influence on the king was really good for the nation. So you have this 100 plus year old man. What would you call that? A, a centenarian? Uh, I don't know. 100 plus year old man uh, having an influence on a king who is uh, younger than 40 and the impact of one man and his influence over this uh, young king uh, steers the whole nation in a good direction. You know, but it just reminds you, don't discount yourself in your service to the Lord. If you're faithful, and even though someone, maybe their heart isn't uh, completely committed to God, but you can carry, you can help them to be faithful. You can help them to walk according to the will of the Lord and to do those things. You have that ability and the impact, it may not be for them. It really wasn't helpful to Joash, what Jehoiada did, but it was helpful to the nation and all the people that he had influence over. So it may be that there's a father of a family and the father's not that committed, but you have influence on him and you keep him walking in the way he should walk, even though maybe his heart isn't 100% in it. But what's the impact on his family and his children and, and all the people who are under his influence? It can be a, a major impact. It could be the difference between lost and saved and the influences that they see in their life. So, you know, it's one of those things where sometimes you feel like, what is what I'm doing? I can see they're not in it. And it's taken me a lot of work. But there's service to God. And now that's one of the really critical elements of Joash's reign is you see the impact of a righteous man uh, for a whole nation because of his influence and he, an old righteous man, right? And sometimes we feel like, well, man, I'm, I, what am I going to do now? I can't, I don't have a lot of mobility. I don't have a lot of ability to get out and about, but you do have influence and you have uh, the ability to to affect things in service of God if you're faithful. And Jehoiada was faithful and it had a major impact. However, after Jehoiada died, um, Joash started listening to evil counsel, uh, seemed like a very weak-willed man, and uh, he ended up killing Jehoiada's son, who was a prophet. And because of that, uh, he, he turned evil and then uh, his servants rose up and uh, assassinated him, killed him, conspired against him, and killed him uh, because he killed Zechariah. They didn't forget that. So, um, you know, Joash in the end, even though he was relatively good, uh, toward the end of his reign, he, he turned evil and was killed. But it just kind of helps you to see how do things go. And that's one of the things I like about the kings, is you really can see, 
you kind of see different situations you might find yourself in or you might observe in life, and it gives you some wisdom and bearing on how to deal with it. So following Joash, we have King Amaziah, and Amaziah is kind of an interesting guy. Uh, look with me in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 2. Here it talks about his heart. Uh, it says, he did right in the sight of the Lord, yet not with his whole heart. So here you have uh, Amaziah and his half commitment. Uh, he didn't do it with his whole heart. So he, he was like his father. You know, he did some right things. He didn't worship the idols himself. He didn't uh, um, necessarily work against or reject the temple or do those sorts of things. However, he also didn't prohibit it. He didn't work against the evil. So he was kind of a neutral character. Um, and he did right in, in the sight of the Lord, but not with his whole heart. Now there's some danger with that. You know, it's being half committed. Giving assent without giving any form of commitment to service. Uh, there's a danger with that, and we're going to find out what that is here uh, in a minute. So during his reign, he has a good beginning. So what we see with Amaziah is he is putting together his army and he hires some Israelite mercenaries, essentially, and about 3,000 of them. He pays them a talent of silver per month, I believe was the arrangement. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, but he, he hires this, this group of mercenaries and they're getting ready to go to war. And as he's getting ready to go to war, a prophet comes up to him and tells him, sorry, I was getting a little sidetracked here. Uh, it's the Second Chronicles 25, verses uh, 7 through 10. A prophet comes up to him and tells him, uh, verse 7, A man of God came to him saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel nor with any one of the sons of Ephraim. But if you do go, do it, be, be strong for the battle, yet God will bring you down before the enemy, for God has power to help and to bring down. And Messiah said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents uh, which I have given the troops of, Is uh, the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord has much more to give to you than this. Then Amaziah dismissed them. The troops which came to him from Ephraim to go home. So their anger burned against Judah, and they returned home in fierce anger. So this is actually, think about the pressure of that situation. You hire a band of mercenaries. You pay them 100 talents. It's 100 talents, not a talent a month. But you pay them 100 talents. Of, uh, 100 talents. They come up ready for war. Now, mercenaries are not just going to war because they have to go to war, right? Uh, they're more like Vikings, where uh, going to war is kind of a uh, part of their honor and they like doing that kind of thing. So they're kind of the rough guys and, and so that seems to be their disposition. From plunder, yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate you adding that in because that's exactly right. Is is they 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 had more to benefit than the pay which was offered to them. Uh, yeah, I appreciate bringing that up. So, um, he turns them around. Now, usually a conversation like that isn't just, hey guys, we don't need you. All right, we'll see you later. It's not that kind of a conversation. You're going to have negotiations. You're going to have pressure. Uh, obviously, Amaziah held his ground and dismissed them, and they were not pleased with the outcome. Uh, turns out what they end up doing, they go and raid the cities of Judah while Amaziah and his army are out fighting Edom. So they actually turn against him. But I want to take note of the two things that this man of God said to him. First, uh, 2 Chronicles 25, verse 8, God has power to help or to bring down. 
It's kind of just an interesting little tidbit in here, but it, he's, he's like, look, don't you realize if you have God on your side, there is a benefit to it. And if you go against him, there is a negative side to that. He can help you. He can bring you down. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how good it looks. And in fact, if he learned from his father, uh, Joash, this small band of Aramean guys came up and they defeated Joash's huge army. Uh, it was, they shouldn't have won and they did anyway because God helped them. And that's what it says. God helped them. Here, Joash or, or um, Amaziah, he's going up to war against Edom. Uh, and the Lord says, We're gonna, I'll help you, but you can't, can't, can't bring Israel with you. So he decides to go along with what God said. He was wise in that. Um, he's like, what about the money? Hey, the Lord's going to bless you way more than what you're losing out in this little thing here. Israel, the mercenaries were angry, went home, or at least went raiding in Judah. Verse 14 through 16. 2 Corinthians 25, 14 through 16. Uh, now, after Amaziah came from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought the gods of the sons of Seir, set them up as his gods, bowed down before them, and burned incense to them. Yeah, that's what in the world? <laughs> what is happening here? And I was thinking, why would you do that? And I, you know, I mean, you could speculate. It doesn't really tell you why. I don't know if it's just recognition. Or, like, I don't know why they would do this sort of thing. I don't know if there's a cultural element to it. But whatever it is, uh, it shows that um, he wasn't taking spiritual things seriously. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, but... He, here, something I, I was kind of mulling over this. Like, why would you do something like that? And, and just when have we seen this sort of a thing? Because I always think, what would cause me to do something like that? Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure there was a logic behind it, but I don't know that we would agree with it regardless. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about um, when, I can't remember which pope it was, but he was kind of a, one of the, in, kind of towards the end of Rome or maybe after the fall of Rome. Uh, but he would go into nations and he would adopt their idolatrous traditions and co-opt them into uh, Christian practices. So we have like Easter, you know, the Easter bunny, the eggs, and why are bunnies laying eggs? Well, all those are actually kind of symbols from the Astra, Astra, the god of fertility. And, and rabbits, very fertile. Eggs, kind of a sign of fertility. Um, there's a few other things that kind of go along with that, but, you know, we see that co opted. And, um, uh, Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, there, there's th with Christmas and even some of the symbols of Christmas, you know, a big guy with a tree. And uh, that's actually, if you look at ancient depictions of Nimrod, he's holding a Christmas tree with a reindeer under his arm and, or holding a pine tree, I guess, with a reindeer under his arm and, and kind of has a Santa Claus look. You know, so a lot of the symbology that goes that the, the so what, what he would do, though, is he would co-opt idolatrous symbols in order to, uh, um, to uh, make it easier for those cultures to accept uh, Christian culture. So that, but, but it's like, well, why would you adopt their idols? Well, maybe if you conquer a nation, maybe you want that nation to be loyal to you. So you start worshiping their gods, you're really paying them a high honor because you conquered them and still you're recognizing their gods, you're giving them... You know, so who knows why? But what do churches do? In modern America, what do churches do? Um, someone was telling me, and I don't, not all churches do this, clearly, but um, this is just an example of it, is he was talking about a United Church of God that he was watching like two or three weeks ago. 
the guy was teaching on 2 Kings about the mantle of Elijah and Elisha. He was dressed in the same clothing uh, he wore to meet his gay partner in a gay bar and saying, this is my mantle of glory. Now, what's he doing? He's trying to make Christianity appealing to your culture. He's adopting the sin from the culture and trying to bring it into what we're doing to serve God or include it with it. And, and a lot of times the church will do that sort of thing. See, do what you like, but still serve Jesus. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. You want music? We'll give you music. You want, um, you know, you want clubs to be in? We'll give you clubs to be in. You want food? We'll feed you. Like, and you start appealing to what's going to draw people to be involved with social programs and use that as a way to lure people to church. And as long as you just give assent to Jesus, then we're all good. Um, and that's the same sort of, now it's not idolatry, but what it is doing, it is taking the desire of the flesh and incorporating it into your service to God or making that a primary element of service to God. And, and really that is kind of what he's doing here, is he's just taking something that appeals to the flesh and adopting it for his own for whatever reason uh, and thinking, I can have two parallel tracks going. Um, and what Jesus says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy to be called my disciple. You know, and so you just have this contrast. But it's something we, can be care we need to be careful too, because I've even heard of, uh, you know, even in, in uh, efforts to evangelize, even within the Church of Christ, trying to make appeals the same way other kinds of uh, denominations do. And it can be very, and it takes away from. You know, our appeal needs to be through the gospel of Jesus, the way God would have us to do it. And I'm emphasizing this because we'll see this from a different angle here uh, in, in um, Uzziah as well. But Amaziah, he adopted the gods of, of uh, Edom and burned incense to them. Maybe that's not coincidence. Him burning, what he burned, in, how he burned incense. We're going to see how Uzziah burned incense. Verse 15. The anger of the Lord burned against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people who have not delivered their own people from your hand? He's like, have you thought this through? That's what the prophet's saying. Why are you worshiping a God who could not deliver his own people from your hand? And now you're bowing your loyalty to him? How does that even make sense? It's the same thing. Why are you appealing to people uh, on, on the terms of the flesh when their flesh cannot deliver them? Jesus says, deny the flesh. And yet, we're making our appeal according to the flesh? That does not make sense. You know, our appeal needs to be according to God. And, and so it's just one of those things. Is it, it, we have a hard time identifying with idols. But the appeals of the flesh, I think we can identify with. And we need to make sure that we don't measure our service to God and our desire to serve God according to the will of the flesh, but the will of the Spirit. And that needs to be very important to us. That needs to be a standard we hold up and uh, follow. Any thoughts or comments on that before we move forward? Um, so, uh, in verse 20, uh, 2 Chronicles 25, verse 20, it says, But Amaziah would not listen, for it was from God, and then he might deliver them into the hand of Joash. Hang on, let me back up. Oh, uh, Amaziah. So, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, Jehoahash is king in Israel, and he is doing well as far as militarily and Israel, he's, he's, he's a good leader. Uh, they're doing well. They're not godly, but they're doing well. Uh, so Amaziah says, let's fight. Let's go to war. And Jehoahash sends back the message. Uh, Thicket uh, invites the cedar of Lebanon to give his daughter in marriage. 
In the meantime, an animal walked by and crushed the thicket, and saying, you are the weed, and I'm the cedar tree. Now look, you know, your pride is swollen because you had a victory over Eden. Enjoy that. But don't try and pick a fight with me. Uh, Amaziah wasn't going to listen. He decides, no, I, I'm going I'm to pick a fight with this guy too. I'm going to beat him. And he was clobbered. He lost the wealth of the kingdom. His people were brought into captivity. Jerusalem's defenses were destroyed and tore down. It was a, quite a major defeat. And so here's the second thing, is you see the impact of pride. And I would say probably bringing the idols uh, is a product of Amaziah's pride as much as uh, him trying to pick a fight uh, without any sort of wisdom. You had a thought? Okay. Uh, so, so this pride element is another aspect of it. And really, there's a pride in trying to do it our own way instead of honoring the way the Lord has given us to do things. So Amaziah loses uh, his kingdom and falls to Jehoahaz, or yeah, Jehoahaz, uh, and, and ends up uh, being brought low. So let's turn now to 2 Chronicles 26. We're going to talk about uh, Uzziah. So in Judah, there were kings who were okay. You have Joash and Amaziah. They, they weren't 100% on board with serving God, but they weren't opposed to him, and they at least upheld the law. Um, Joash was killed. I believe Amaziah, one of the things he did is he didn't ki kill the sons of the men who killed his father because of the law. So you see him honoring God. He, he listened to the prophet of God, but then he brought in the idols and, and kind of spiraled out of control from there. Uzziah, um, he was a good king. Like he was really all in on serving God. So in, in chapter 26, uh, 2 Chronicles 26, verse, uh, actually verse 5, he continued to seek, oh, verse 4, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who, who had understanding through the vision of God, as long as, he, as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. So Uzziah was a good king. He sought the Lord. There was a prophet named Zechariah uh, that was living in his time, and he took good counsel from Zechariah and followed his advice and, and served him. Uh, in addition to that, we see actually Isaiah, uh, he serves God during the end of Uzziah's reign. In Isaiah 1.1, it mentions him. Isaiah 6.1, Isaiah's uh, great vision of the throne of God actually coincides with the death of Uzziah. Um, and you can see why that would be upsetting because you have this good king who dies. What's going to happen next with our kingdom? Uh, and I, Isaiah was concerned about that. So and the, God gave him some reassurance. So uh, Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, all living during this time period. He does right in the sight of God. But in 2 Kings 15, uh, as it's talking about this, it says one thing he fails to do is he did right in the sight of the Lord. This is 2 Kings 15, verse 3. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. Only the high places were not taken away. The people still, burn, still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So this is a point of compromise. Again, he did what was right for him, but as a king, he could have uh, removed the high places and he failed to do so. We'll see a king come up uh, that's going to do that, but Uzziah didn't have quite that, um, that conviction there. But he did seek God and he did do well, uh, generally speaking. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, and verse 16, this is just, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit deeper, but it just we're talking about his heart condition. Uh, 16, it says, But when he, came strong, when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. 
So here you see, it's kind of just an interesting parallel when you put them side by side. Who did Amaziah burn incense to that was wrong? The gods of Edom. Who is Uzziah? How is Uzziah burning incense that's wrong? He's going against the command of the Lord in burning incense. And that is also very uh, wrong to him. But uh, why is he doing that? He's proud. His pride swell up. Why did Amaziah do it? He's proud. He let his pride swell up and, and was foolish in, in what he's doing. So you kind of see a parallel between these things. Um, is that uh, they're unfaithful for different reasons, but unfaithful nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, Azariah was, he, he uh, um, was strong against this sort of behavior. So let's go actually go ahead and read this whole section, because I want to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about his kingdom in a minute, uh, but I want to begin by just talking about this particular uh, instance in his uh, kingdom. In fact, Actually, we'll just we'll start at the beginning of uh, Second Chronicles 26, and we'll look through some of the highlights of his kingdom. He did right in the sight of God. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 6 through 8. Uh, now he went out and warred against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath and the walls of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities in the area of Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal, and the Munites, the Ammonites, also paid tribute to Uzziah, and his fame extended to the border of Egypt, for he became very strong. So here you just see uh, he's, a, he's uh, doing right in the eyes of God, and you see God helping him. Uh, and I appreciate, like, I wish, you know, almost in the uh, narrative of our own life, I wish we had this same sort of a little side note that, uh, would happen is uh, God helped him. Now, we don't get that in our life. Uh, we just have to look at the way providence works and attribute it to God. But in this case, there's prophets who wrote this down and God revealed to, him, to them as they're writing that here's what's happening behind the scene. And part of the reason it reveals it to us so that we can know when we're pleasing to God, God helps us. And sometimes you see things go badly. The, we, you know, Amaziah was a basically ha, had a lot of good qualities. And then uh, Jehoahaz, he was just rotten. And yet, even though it says Amaziah did good in the sight of the Lord, he was defeated by Jehoahaz, who was worse than him. Now we see why, is his pride in bringing in the gods of Edom. But even still, that was quite a bit better than Jehoahaz. And so you see the Lord working in those things. But either way, the Lord did intervene. And even for, um, for Amaziah, that was what was right for him. And, and the Lord was working on his behalf, even though it was against him. Here you see Isaiah, uh, the Lord's working on his behalf. In verses 9 through 10, uh, you see this uh, picture of the way he ruled. He was a wise leader. Uh, moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the corner buttress and fortified them. He built towers in the wilderness and hewed many cisterns, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plain. He also had plowmen and vine dressers in the hill country and the fertile fields, uh, for he loved the soil. So you just get, he wasn't a war kind of a king. He was a king who liked being productive. He, he, uh, he loved seeing his land produce. So he saw to the well-being of the land. He made sure there was water and, and uh, cultivation and those sorts of things. In Ecclesiastes 5.9, this is uh, just a little, uh, just an interesting little tidbit from Ecclesiastes. It says, um, after all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. So you see that... Uh, Maybe he read the book of Ecclesiastes because one of his forebearers wrote it for 
uh, future generations, and maybe he saw the wisdom in that. But either way, um, he took pleasure in gardening and seeing his land cultivated and being productive. He wasn't just a war king. He was actually a king who wanted to see his land prosper. And I think that's what it's showing us here. Uh, verses 11 through 13 talks about his standing army. Uh, he had an army of uh, skilled men. Uh, verse 13, it says, Under their direction was an elite army of 307,500 men. So you have highly trained and... You know, probably in their day, you have the consignment guys like, you know, come fight with us and the farmers leave their field and bring their pitchforks and, and axes and stuff and go to war. So you have kind of an unskilled army, but these would be more like our, uh, an American army where you have soldiers who are professional soldiers. Um, likely that's the kind of army he had. So big deterrent uh, to protect him. It says he could wage war with great power uh, and to help the king against the enemy. And then we'll jump forward in verse 15. This talks about the fortification and military technology, which you don't think too much about in the Bible, uh, having uh, kings having technology. But uh, this is interesting. In Jerusalem, he made engines of war invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. Hence his fame spread afar, for he was marvelously, marvelously helped until he was strong. So here is just an interesting thing, but the Lord uh, helped him to gain advanced technology to defend his city. And everyone knew, you come up against uh, Uzziah, they're going to throw massive rocks at you, which sounds like a trebuchet or that kind of a weapon. Also, maybe a ballista shooting these large arrows. So he had just um, advancement in military technology on his side. Um, so you just see, you know, he was blessed in a lot of ways. Now we get to verse 16, and this is where you see all, likely what happened was he stopped trusting in the Lord and started trusting in his own capabilities. I have war engines, I have an elite army, I have productive fields, I have... Uh, flourishing livestock. Uh, I have kings who pay tribute to me. Uh, everyone's afraid of me. I am a big deal. It said he became famous. Uh, everyone heard of Isaiah, you know, um, and he started trusting in himself and what he could accomplish, his wisdom and his abilities and all those things, and didn't trust in the Lord. And all of a sudden, he found himself in a position where, no, I want to be the one who does the incense. I want to make it, I want to feel more reverent. I want to do the thing. And we're going to find out that's not the way it works. Verse 16, but when he, he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly and he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Then Azariah the priest entered after him, uh, with him eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, was enraged. And while he was enraged, the priest, with the priest, the leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord besides the altar of incense. Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And, and they hurried him out of there, and he himself also hastened to get, get out, because the Lord had smitten him. So it seems like he changed his mind pretty quick. Right? Uh, he's in there. No, you guys need to get out. There's 80 priests. Not just like one or two guys. 80 guys. And when they said, you can't be doing this, he was enraged at them. And in his rage, a little leprosy on the forehead. Um, and they all stopped. They're like, you just got leprosy on your forehead. And all of a sudden, Isaiah is like, I better get out of here. You, you, know, you, you know, I've had a change of heart. Um, and what ends up happening with Uzziah? He went from being a famous king to being a pariah. 
He was an isolated leper. He couldn't even go in and give judgments in his own court. Uh, talk about, a, a can this kingdom operate without you? No, I'm a big deal. They need me. If they didn't have me, they wouldn't make it any further. Maybe sometimes we can get feeling that way about things. No. You know what? Uh, we don't, they, don't, they didn't need him. He became isolated. He was limited in what he could do. He could maybe give the, his seal of approval, but his son had to be the co-regent and do the work, the, the at least one-on-one -on -one work of a king. And the kingdom continued, and he was isolated. You know, just one of those things you really see is how big of a deal are you really? You get this pride about things, and you realize, you know, the Lord doesn't need you to accomplish his work. He allows us to be part of it. He blesses us to have service. It's kind of like uh, when I was, would go out and cut the grass, uh, Mason wanted to cut the grass with me. Now Journey does. Um, and they're, following, they're pushing the mower, following with me, thinking they're being a pretty big help. Mason had a little plastic mower and he would walk behind me. Uh, and you know what? I didn't need them to mow the lawn. In fact, it made my job a little bit harder. Um, but how did they feel? They felt pretty good. It was a blessing for them for me to allow them to help. And, and all that's a small scale, but when God allows us to be part of worship and, and part of serving him, it's a blessing to us. And we need to make sure we don't take that blessing and make it pride and then start making our own demands. Jim? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And, and so, the, and there is an impact of us uh, being unfaithful in these various ways. Larry? It seems like, like oftentimes when things are going really well for us, it's easy for us to maybe stop recognizing that it's God that's allowing those things to happen and just start thinking, oh, I'm working so hard. All these things that I'm doing are. Yeah, I think that's a really great application for this is, yeah, is when things start going well, maybe it doesn't come out in the way he's doing it here, but maybe you're just less grateful. You know, you just say thank you less, whether or not you appreciate it in your heart, you just don't take time to pray, don't take time to acknowledge it. And you, if, you know, you look at your life is when times are stressful and hard and you're praying a lot, when times are really good, Maybe you skip a day or two, or maybe you're not doing those things. And we just, we can learn from this is no, is in good times and bad times, we need to honor God appropriately. Um, and that's a, yeah, that's a great point in that. Um, also, um, there's another thing in here, and this, and this is, I, I, I just, looking at this, There's a lot of there's it's easy to start getting the idea that being legalistic about things in the sense of doing it just the way God told us to do it might feel tedious or why do we have to do it that way? What difference does it make? Is that really right? Or, you know, I've heard some people, you really think God's going to send you to hell for doing this? Like those sorts of we start justifying. I want to do it my way. I have some good ideas too, or this is better, this is more comfortable, this is however we want to spin that. You know, the reality is, he was burning incense. What, what's the big deal? Just burning incense. What's the big deal? The reality is, is when God says to do something, it's perfect the way he made it. To alter it is an act of enormous pride to alter what God has given us to do. I think, too, that 
Yeah, to think we can alter them to make them better is very foolish. And, and also, what it says here is, he became proud and acted unfaithfully. And sometimes we don't want to think, well, if I'm not taking my role as a father, I'm being unfaithful. But it is true. You got to take, you got to do the role that God gave you. You got to recognize what God gave us to do in the way he gave us to do it. I want to take a look real quick in Isaiah chapter 1. Just note, so just note the way he talks about worship. Now this was written in the time of Isaiah. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared up, reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its ma- manger, but Israel does not know. Uh, my people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Where will you be stricken again, or you continue your? Where will you be stricken again, or you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick, and the heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, not softened with oil. Your land is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is like a shelter in a vineyard. Um, Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of your God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and goats. Uh, When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of the assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove evil from your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plea for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I just find this interesting. He's talking about the very rituals that Isaiah uh, um, despised. But what he's saying is, going through those motions with a heart that is full of iniquity is not what I've asked you to do. Isaiah almost almost, uh, um, personified God's complaint through Isaiah. He goes in and just does whatever he wants to do without consideration, is this pleasing to God? And the priests come and say, this is not pleasing to God. This is not going to be well for you. But the reality is, those priests were doing the same thing because they were trampling the courts too. This is how God described worship in the time. It's a trampling of my courts. Because you do not honor me, you don't cleanse yourself in iniquity, you have not repented, uh, you have not yielded to my will. But even in all of that, he says, 
Just come, let us reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. We can fix this, but it's not going to be through uh, self-will and your own solutions. We need to follow my way. And it's the same thing. Is as I didn't follow God's way, and it was not well for him. Uh, the leprosy in Scripture is almost like a, a, uh, something you can see that, that um, demonstrates sinfulness. It's, it, in, in the New Testament, they're never uh, healed from leprosy. They're cleansed of leprosy. In the Old Testament, just the way that lepros, leprous people were treated is, has a lot of parallels to the way someone who's ritually unclean is treated. Um, it, is the, it kind of uh, gives you a visual aid of the impact of sin on your soul before God. And so you kind of see that with Uzziah, is the impact of sin. As you, he got the leprosy, and he was separated from the temple of God for the rest of his life. He could not even come near to worship. But that really shows you, when you're walking around uh, corrupted by sin, without repentance and without forgiveness... That's your um, disposition towards God and, and coming near to Him. And he says, it can be cleaned away, but you have to give up your own self-will in this. I just really think that's an interesting... Uh, you kind of see kind of the back end from Isaiah. What was it like? What was the experience of being in that nation? And what was God seeing? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, is that, you know, but that's a good question. Though. How's that working out for you? You know, is, is, is that really getting you the result you want? And, you know, Jesus talked about the same thing is, look, don't pray for a pretense. You got your reward in full. If you pray, do it so God can hear you. Um, and really, that's, that's what God wants us to do. I'm not going to try and get into these five kings of Israel. I, I, I wanted to kind of spend my time on, spend some time on Isaiah a little bit more than I did, more, a little bit more than I anticipated, but that's par for the course uh, for me. But, um, you know, I liked the way these two fit together and really just gives us a reminder is to honor God by following him, uh, to hold to his standards. You know, and that's one of the things, you know, as a church we try to do. We try to understand what did God ask the church to do and do those things. Simply understanding the scripture, following his will. Um, there's a lot of ways we do that. You know, well, how did God say to call on him to be saved? Well, we do it through baptism. Yeah, but you can make all these other arguments. Why is that necessary? Well, it doesn't matter. Look, God said be baptized and be saved. So that's what we do. We worship in a simple way. We sing hymns and we have a sermon and we take the Lord's Supper. We take up a collection and we pray together. We do all these things because that's what we see the New Testament church doing. It's just a simple thing. We leave out all the pomp and tradition. We don't, uh, as a congregation in the building, celebrate Easter or Christmas. Why? Because God didn't tell us to do that. We celebrate the things God told us to celebrate. As a church, we try to be a church family because God said, love one another. First uh, Peter chapter 1, maybe 22 or 21 or 22. Since you have cleansed your heart, uh, cleansed your soul for a sincere love of the brethren, let us love one another sincerely from the heart. Part of what God gave us to do as Christians and part of our purification from sin is so we can love one another. So let us do that. And, and we try to do that as a, as a, as a tr congregation of people. And we try to serve one another in various ways. And it's, it's simple. There's not a lot of complexity. And we try to understand the scripture simply because we want to have the disposition of honoring God according to his will. And there may be things we need to work on or change and, you know, modify. And that's good, too, is we have a disposition Hey, show me how I can do it better, and I'll try and do it better. Whatever that happens to be. Because we don't have an opinion about what we want to do. What we want to do is follow the command and the will of our God as best as we can. And, and part of that's also going to be 
is not on the, there's a front end, right? What are we doing and actively participating in? And there's a back end. Am I truly seeking a relationship with God? And that's the other part of this. That's what Isaiah addresses. You can do all the right things. If you're not seeking a relationship with God, you're still not there. Uh, the prodigal son, the elder brother, he did everything right and he was still lost. He was still in the outer darkness because he didn't seek a relationship with the father. The younger son, he eventually came to his senses, sought a relationship with the father, understood the value of it, and he was in at the, at the celebration while the elder was out. And we want to be like the younger, we actually want to be like Jesus, the true elder brother who seeks a relationship with the Father and seeks the lost as well and tries to bring them, try to bring that younger brother back in too. And all these things are according to the will of the Lord. We want to be faithful to him and follow in his ways and honor him in this way because look at the blessing. Not only in, there's a spiritual blessing to follow, definitely eternal life is a pretty uh, good deal. You know, just knowing, look, I'm not going to die, I'm just going to go live better. Uh, that's a, that's a, what a blessing that is. But also, just our ability to accomplish much for, the, for God's purpose in this life is also a true blessing that we have. But it comes from faithfulness. It comes from seeking true relationship with God and seeking to honor God in our actions and in, in our worship and, and in our walk. Any thoughts or comments before we close? All right. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our most gracious God and Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you at this time. Lord, we're so thankful uh, to be called your sons and daughters and to be able to come to you in worship, to have your ear in prayer, and to have confidence in a clean and pure heart before you because of the blood of Jesus. We pray, God, that we would not uh, walk in the steps of Amaziah and Isaiah, who allowed their pride to get in their way of their uh, love for you. But uh, we pray we would be humble and uh, meek and um, servants as, as we have an example in Jesus, the true king, uh, our, our true king. We pray, God, as we uh, go through the rest of this week, that the things we do would bring glory to you, whether it is um, the small uh, tasks and chores we do. We pray that we do it with the right attitude and, and in a manner that is uh, to honor you. But also, Lord, we pray that as we meet people, as we have opportunities to serve and to teach and to proclaim your excellencies, that we would take those opportunities. Pray that you would open doors for us. Pray that you would um, grant opportunities for us to save lost souls here in this community. And Lord, we uh, pray that um, we would be ready uh, to ready with what to say, ready with um, what we need to do, and ready to say yes when you call us, dear Lord. We pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks. What was that?